three, open Q&A panel. Here to answer your questions are Jay Wilson, Kevin Martins, Christian Leitner, Jason Regier, and Robert Breidenbecker. How's BlizzCon going? Awesome. All right, so this is just an hour of asking us any questions that you want to. Uh, my name's Jay, and I work on Diablo. Uh, this is Kevin Martins. He's our uh, lead content designer and more the lore and story guy, so I don't have to answer those. Uh, Jason Regeer is our uh, lead programmer. Robert Breidenbecker. R Rob, what's your title? VP Online Tech. He's the VP of Online Tech. Um, and Christian Leitner, who's our art director. So I think we can cover almost anything. So whenever you guys are ready. All right, you guys are ready? We're ready, Chad. Let's do it. Good Chad, to see you guys. One request, Chad. We've been doing a lot of press. No more of the why are you guys so sexy questions. <laughs> We're tired of answering them. I'll try to hold off for now. Okay, thanks, Chad. Maybe later, though. All right, come on up. So yesterday, during the panel, you guys were talking about difficulty level, how a normal mode's going to be really, really easy. But what about veteran players? Are we really going to have to beat the game once before we get any kind of challenge? Are you guys going to add a way to make the game harder before progressing? Um, no, we're not planning on any, any kind of shortcut through normal difficulty. Um, uh, just like Diablo 2, uh, normal difficulty will be fairly quick path. Um, we're not too worried about people getting bored. It does get more challenging. Um, kind of later in even the first act and progressively throughout. So I wouldn't say that the entire of normal difficulty is not nearly as easy as the first hour or so. The first hour is really a tutorial. So I, what we really feel internally, what we've noticed with a lot of people playing, especially more serious players, is once they get through that first part really quick and then they get into the rest of, act, of the, the normal difficulty and they don't have any problems with getting bored or things like that because it is challenging enough. Um, I, I should also say that, you know, the normal difficulty level, if you're a veteran, you know, awesome Diablo player, this is your chance to enjoy the story, get familiar with the skills, so that you can really kick ass with them in the next difficulty level. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. Uh, how you doing? Um, to me, there's three type of players in Blizzard games. There's hardcore, uh, and then, then there's, uh, uh, you know, casual gamers, and then there's farmers. Um, and with Farmer being such a big industry, thanks to WoW, um, how do you guys plan on combating this? Because I know the farming industry is already looking at Diablo and going, how can we make some more money? Well, we don't really see that it's as big an issue for Diablo as it is for WoW. The most important thing to remember about Diablo is it's not a persistent world. So the reason that um, farming feels so bad in World of Warcraft is because the farmers are in your world, they're taking your quest mobs, they're taking your drops, they're interfering with your experience. Um, but in Diablo, they can go off into their own server, into their own world, in their own instance, um, and farm to their heart's content, and it doesn't affect you at all. So that's really the big issue in terms of, uh, you know, the, the downside of farmers is really their impact on the world more than anything else. So uh, we don't feel it's going to be a big problem in Diablo. Thank you. Come on up. With the release of Diablo 3, I was wondering what the chat gem is going to do. I mean, I'm sorry, can you repeat, can you repeat that, please? What, what's the chat gem do? What is the, oh, what is the chat gem? What is the ch Kevin, you want to take that? Um, I still didn't understand the question. What? What does the chat gem do? Um, it fulfills all your dreams. Uh, what's that? Yeah, it nice fulfills all your way. dreams. It's that's cool. Oh, that's, yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, you guys made the followers more viable for endgame content, you know, because the feedback wanted it. Uh, is there any benefit, or is it even possible to get to the end of the game in Inferno without a follower? Uh, yeah, it should be totally uh, possible to... Uh, the way we're trying to tune them is to make them viable, not required. 
Um, so they do give some nice bonuses that I, as any kind of, if you're a super min-maxer, you're really going to want them there. Um, but if you just care about, if you really don't like followers, and there are definitely people out there, is one of the reasons we originally considered not making them viable, then you should be able to play without them. Also, you know, this won't be for ship, but we still kind of want to figure out a way that you can get a benefit of a follower without having a follower, but we're not sure, we never figured out exactly how we want to do that. Um, so, but that's something we're going to explore in the future. Thank you. All right, um, straight up question, is Diablo a girl? Uh, Dia the question is, Diablo a girl? Um, Diablo's not um, constrained by our human gender stereotypes. Uh, She's a demon. So no, the, the fact is, um, Diablo can take multiple forms, and, in, and we have never seen the true form of Diablo yet, so um, Diablo has many surprises in, in store for us. That was good, all right. That's kind of that's kind of a shifty answer. Just it's the answer to the dude's question, Kevin. All my answers are shifty. Oh, okay, fair enough. Hey guys, I was hoping you could elaborate on hardcore mode. Um, for example, uh, when it's unlocked, are there going to be real money transactions, and uh, are there any differences between Diablo 2 hardcore mode and Diablo 3? Anything we should expect? Yeah. So, um, hardcore mode. Where to start? Um, so, for those of you who don't know. Once, uh, if you make a hardcore character and that character ever dies, the character's gone forever. So, um, the big things about hardcore, hardcore's completely separated from the regular games, so they do have their own auction house, but it's a gold-only auction house. They don't have a real money auction house. And they can't trade in any way with regular characters. So they're isolated within, they can trade with their hardcore characters, but not with normal characters. They also can't trade items play with regular characters. So they're isolated within, they can trade with other hardcore characters, but not with normal characters. They also can't trade items between, you can't trade items between your hardcore characters and your regular characters. Um, and then the other big, the big difference is when you die, your body doesn't drop. So you, you're gone, your items are gone when you die in D3. So it's not like you can have somebody with you who can collect your body and pull your stuff up. So it's a little bit harsher on that front. Um, and then. PvP is something we're still kind of t internally debating. I think the PvP strike team is really concerned that um, if we have you die permanently in an arena, then hardcore players will never play arena. And that, I think that's probably a good point. I still feel like there needs to be some kind of way to do hardcore dueling. So we're thinking about how we can allow that. Uh, no flag. That's it. I'm sorry. Get back in line, though. <laughs> wow, Chad. Cracking the whip. It's not my fault. Hey guys, I got a couple questions about Inferno mode. First one, do you expect Fresh 60s to be able to succeed in, heart, or in Inferno? And two, do you ever plan on nerfing Inferno to make it more accessible to uh, the casual players? So, I didn't get the first part of the question. Do you guys expect Fresh 60 characters to be able to succeed in Inferno? Ah, okay. Um, no. We expect you will have to farm hell. So, and will we nerf it for, for, um, for all the noobs out there? Um, probably not. Hey, calm down. We, we said it was going to be hard. We had a video and everything. Jeez. Um, probably not. I wouldn't promise that we'd never nerf it because certainly we've seen, like, in the development of World of Warcraft, we've seen, like, super hard bosses show up and, and even the most hardcore of the hardcore go, okay, He's a little too hard. So I don't want to say that we never nerf something because it could be too hard even for the super hardcore. Um, so, but we won't nerf it to make it casual. Thank you. Hi, uh, this, this might be a stupid question, but uh, I was in Diablo 1 and 2, there was a considerable amount of fog of war. I was wondering in Diablo 3 if, uh, why that wasn't there. Oh, I guess there's not as much. There is Fog of War in Diablo 3. Yeah, uh, we, I, I, we did take Fog of War out of your hub town, so like New Tristram has no Fog of War, so you can easily find all the stores and stuff, but unless we're misunderstanding you, there is Fog of War everywhere else. I mean, we changed the, we changed the reveal distances. They may not be consistent with Diablo 2. Yeah. Or, do you, or do you mean the light radius? Yeah. I, around I the, oh, the light radius, okay. Yeah, I guess. 
Um, you know, a lot of that we were. That was a long, kind of hard process, and there are some dungeons in the game that really do emphasize the light ray because it is there. Um, it was more a, a thing of that going to a 3D engine and trying to get the world to look really good and you know be moody and feel the way we want when you only have one light. Like it's easier with a 2D engine where uh, kind of everything, every sprite is kind of hand drawn with its light already in it. But with a 3D engine, if you have one light around the character, it actually makes for a really kind of bland and bad looking world. You need to fill the world with a little bit more light to make it interesting. And so it made it really difficult for us to do the, the light radius exactly the way we did D2. But we did try to do it in some of the dungeons. Yeah, yeah, it is still in there. Uh, it's, uh, there are various areas in the game that are brighter than others and some are darker than others. And maybe what you're seeing in the content that's out on the show floor is a little bit brighter than some of our darkest areas. So, Great question. Hi. Uh, with respect to randomization in dungeons, there are some areas in Diablo 2 that can be frustratingly convoluted. I was wondering, like, why would you make a jail like that or the catacombs? Um, are you guys toning that down a little in Diablo 3? So, Kevin, I think the question is, um, are we going to not do crappy design? <laughs> it's to you. I, I'd love to know what you're, exactly what you're referring to. Um, so most dungeons are very random. Um, a change from Diablo 2 to Diablo 3 is there is quite a bit more story moments in the dungeons themselves. So in a completely random dungeon, as in one that rolls randomly out in the world, very often you've got a unique entry point. Um, say the Idol of Ragnar, there's a guy named Poltar who's a treasure hunter, and he gets into this little, these old ruins and he can't get through in his own. So it's an escort mission, and it concludes at the end. So there's random dungeon in between, but he's got a, a set starting point and a set final room, and the, the, the quest concludes. In other cases, like you'll see in the beta, we have some uh, levels that are very that have very little randomness, like the Templar level. So you acquire the Templar in that level. He's got his little story moments, his open room. But even in there, there's some randomness in between the, the first room and the end room. Uh, he's got a much bigger set spot because he's got to get his armor and have his rescue scene and then have his final confrontation with Jondar and, and uh, ultimately kill him. Spoiler! Um, so I'm not sure if I answered your question. There's, there's still a ton of randomness, especially in the dungeons. Thank you. Hi. Um, with, with there being a monetary aspect tied to the game via the auction hall now, my question is around the botting. So Diablo 2 was pretty much ruined by botting in its later years, and I'd like to know what you guys are doing to increase the warden protection for botting. That's all you, baby. Okay, so it's a, uh, the question is basically, what are we going to do about bots? Um, so number one, I mean, uh, as Jay was talking about a little bit earlier, yeah, uh, there's, there's no question uh, from, from a warden standpoint, that's an investment that we've spent the past 10 years on. We're going to continue to do that. We've, we've actually been sort of insidiously, uh, you know, trying to figure out how it is that people are going through and re-engineering some of our systems or better understanding them. Um, we have some inherent protections given the nature of Diablo's gameplay in that uh, it, it, it does render the bots a little less effective, but it, it still makes it where an individual can go through and they can, they can just grind for 24 hours at a time. Um, so we're going to be monitoring that. We're going to be policing it really well uh, and making sure that we maintain the consistency of the gameplay. So I'm gonna, I want to follow up on that too, because one of the things that I know is really annoying in Diablo 2 is the uh, people who would jump into games and broadcast and jump out, and that's something we'll be looking at as well. Um, it's a, actually a little tougher to do in um, our, our setup than it would be in, uh, than it was in Diablo 2, just inherently in how we kind of designed how you jump in and out of games. Um, but we're definitely going to look to any kind of like spamming or things like that, we'll look to try and stop as well. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, uh, here from New Zealand, I uh, was trying the monk out and I was just wondering, um, are all his strikes uh, single click, single attack, or are there some like the old Barbarians D2 frenzy where you can just hold and go forever? Um, well, a lot of the abilities, yeah, you can, you can hold down um, and some you can't, but most of them, most of the time you can just kind of right click drive with uh, a particular ability if you want. Um, we've tried to design the combat so that 
there's really the most optimal way to play is never with just one ability just held um, that it's always you're going to be better if you can swap in at least a, a follow-up like a, a big hit that's controlled by either cooldown or resource or something like that because um, we find it's a little bit more fun when you're using a couple of abilities together um, so but yeah you can you can do the same control scheme as Diablo 2. Great question. Thanks for coming. Hey, um, have you guys thought about adding WSAD movement controls so that players don't have to spam the mouse so much when kiting? Um, you know, we've played around with, um, and mostly, mostly played a lot with games that used that um, in kind of an isometric view. And the general feeling we had was two things. One, you don't really want to support two control schemes. Um, it's really hard to make one control scheme feel great. Having to make two feel great just makes the challenge that much bigger. And we found just kind of the non-analog nature of the WASD doesn't work very well with isometric play. Like, we felt it didn't feel good, um, so we decided to stick completely with the mouse. Thank you. Come on up. Hey guys, um, I just want to ask you, in uh, Diablo 2 you used to have Rune Wars. Right now you in Diablo 3 has um, Rune Stones. So I was, uh, I'm asking that, are you planning to put the Rune Stones, uh, the Rune Wars again? Like Nigma, Phoenix, uh, Treachery, and a bunch of other wars? No sir, we're, we're not. Um, uh, we have a, a lot of new systems that sort of do everything that rune words needed to do. Um, you know, the rune stones, of course, you have your vanilla skill and five variations on that times seven levels. So this is like an, a ludicrously rich system. We also, um, you know, gems are coming back and, and they have more things that they do as well. We've moved a ton of the attribute or the stat points into the itemization game. So, you know, the item game is, is uh, a huge, broad characterization. Um, it's just awesome, yeah. Crafting, you can you make your own uh, items which have some set abilities and always random affixes as well. You can break those things down. You know, that's replaced gambling, for example, if you have something you don't like, um, and so on and so on. Like, so we have a ton of new systems. Uh, we don't actually need rune runes at all anymore. Uh, we have it all covered. Thank you. Hey, uh, I wanted to ask... You guys keep teasing us about console version of the game. Is it coming out on console or not? Um, so, okay, we haven't officially announced anything. Um, so there's my dodgy part of the answer. Um, so we've not, I don't think we've been actually very shy about that. Um, we've hired people. I, we have a console team working internally. So we want to make a console version. I think that's pretty obvious. And, you know, we're hiring right now to try and fill out that team. But we haven't announced it because we don't want to announce something until we're sure. You know, until we have a game that we can show to people, we don't like to announce things. And we've really only kind of been as upfront as we have because we've been trying to hire people. And it's really hard to hire people when you don't, they don't know what they're going to work on. So that's... So, but yeah, we'd really like to, it to be on console. We think it can work there. We've done a lot of experimentation with the controls. Um, but the most important thing for us is if it goes on a console, it does not compromise the PC game in any way, and it feels like it was built for the console. It doesn't feel like a compromised product on either platform. It was like we built it from scratch for that platform. And if we can't do that, we won't do it. Yeah. Yeah. He's happy. Thank you. Hey, this question is about runes. Uh, there's five runes, seven ranks, and one way of doing it was you have a crimson rune and say, I want to throw in a blizzard, and say, I changed my mind, I don't want to use meteor. I take that crimson rune out, put it in meteor instead. And then you changed your minds to where it was locked into one skill, and that created a situation where now you have up to like 5,000 different runes that could be traded or found on the auction house, whatever, because now you have a rank one for each class for each rune type. And you said a couple months ago in a press interview 
that that creates a huge inventory problem. And I was just curious what you were finalizing on, on that. It's so um, the short answer is we don't know. Um, we're still playing with that system. Um, you know, we talked about, I talked about that a few months ago just because, I, you know, I thought it'd be fun to kind of throw out there, hey, here's a system in flux and here's what we're trying to do to fix it. And um, the system we put in has some good things about it. You know, the new ones with all the attunement and things like that. And it has some bad things, the inventory being one of them. Um, and it's definitely a problem we feel we need to fix, but I don't want to speculate on what we're going to do to fix it because we don't exactly know yet. But um, a lot of the times you've got to play with these systems for a while and really understand what all the good about the change you made is so you can figure out how to make it even better. So we are still working on it. It's actually probably the only system that we have that is still in flux in terms of design. Everything else is really pretty solid and just being tuned and polished. But that one, we still feel like it needs it needs something. No, they, back in line, though, we'll get you. Be gentle. Nice hammer. Thanks. Uh, so back in D2, I pretty much perfected the teeth necromancer build, in which I just spammed every point in the teeth. I felt it synergized really well with my character. I was wondering if D3 is going to have any kind of spell equivalent to teeth. A spell equivalent to teeth? Like a similar spell does the same yeah. thing, just a radius of some kind of... Um, yeah, we've got several spells, I would say. I don't, I don't know that we have one that I can think of off the top of my head that's exactly like teeth. Um, but we definitely, uh, we definitely have some skills that are, you know, multiple splitting projectiles with a little bit of kind of randomization. With it. There's, a, there's like, with rune variations, there's like 700 skills per class. So my guess is we actually probably do have one that's exactly like teeth, and that, that's not the class that I'm playing right now. So, uh, but yeah, definitely. You should see something that's similar enough. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, as a designer slash programmer, I was wondering what kind of challenges you had for the design slash implementation for the console of Diablo 3, and what lessons you could learn from them, and I'd like to know about it. I'm sorry, for the what? Um, any design slash implementation challenges you had for the console version okay. of Diablo 3? Got it. And what lessons you learned from it, I'd like to know. Well, I mean, we've, we haven't done, we haven't built it yet, so lessons learned are not very many because we've only experimented with like kind of control schemes and things like that. Um, Jason can probably talk to you of any kind of technical stuff. The biggest challenge is really uh, targeting. Um, it, Movement actually feels better on a controller, like having direct control over your character feels really good. But how you target, like, and, and certain skills like Magic Missile feels great because it's just shooting in a direction. But a skill like Blizzard, I'm trying to figure out exactly where that's going to go without putting some kind of targeting reticle in the world, which you really don't want to do. That, that's actually probably one of the biggest challenges. Um, and then there's a lot of little subtle things. Um, dis monster distribution and AI feels a little bit different than it does on... Um, on the PC version um, when we played around with just, just again, how the controller feels and how it feels to get surrounded. So, but those are very subtle things. Any technical stuff you want to comment on? No, I think it's mostly that control is king. Like, everybody wants a game where you feel like you have great direct control of your character, and that's what we've probably spent most of our time experimenting with um, and trying to make sure that that gets right on, on the console version that we're playing around with. Thank you. Oh, hey guys. Um, so I think I speak for everyone here when I ask, can we get some beta keys? <laughs> yeah, I have some in my back pocket right now. Um, we're going to be releasing more beta keys uh, very shortly. Um, so if you've signed up, you have a chance to get them. So we will definitely, we're trying to keep the beta running as long as we can, and we're going to keep sending out waves of beta keys. Right now we're just waiting. We have a, a big patch coming, and we're just waiting for that patch to hit before we release some more. And for those of you that have been participating in the beta that are here in the audience, thank you so much for playing and testing the heck out of the game. Uh, we really appreciate it. 
Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hi, I went to the sound panel yesterday, and they told me to come to you guys and ask you if you could make a level that would incorporate the sound effect of a pig playing a guitar. Okay. I got this one. Um, and I was also wondering how many other secret areas you guys might have planned for the game. Okay, uh, the pig playing a guitar. This is the third time someone has asked me this question now, and I'd love to know what the sound guys were thinking when they came up with that one, so... Uh, Hey, Christian, can we get the animation of a pig playing guitar? We'll get right on that. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to think of a, <laughs> a super grim storyline to how the pig came to the point in his life where he's got to play a guitar. That's going to be really dark. I see or, the technical problems with it. It won't so. be in at all. We'll see. What, what kind of guitar does a pig play? Like bluesy, maybe? or Yeah, Delta. Delta okay, for uh, sure. Cool, yeah. Banjo. <laughs> Oh, what was the other question? Oh, about other secret areas? Secret areas. Why do you guys always want to know things that spoil the game for you? Why do you always ask those questions? Do we have secret areas? Yes. What are they? Mm -hmm. They're secret. <laughs> it's a secret. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for making followers endgame viable. And... Uh, there were some builds in D2 where the mercenary was your main source of damage, like a single barbarian. Will those be viable builds be viable in D3 as well? Where, um, where the, I'm sorry, that the hireling was the. Your main? follower is the main source of your okay. damage. Um, hmm. I wish Wyatt was here. He would probably be able to answer that. My guess is. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I honestly don't know whether that's the case. We haven't really done enough. Like, we, we changed over to make followers viable very recently, so we haven't played with them in the higher difficulties that much. Um, so how they feel in there and how much damage output they truly have and how much we're willing to give them is going to come through playing it. So um, I don't want to say yes or no to that at, at this time. Thank you. Hey guys, um, so I know how you said in an Inferno the level cap for the characters is at 60, but the monster is going to be 61 and higher so that, you know, the monster is always tough, it's always a challenge, but um, eventually we are going to beat it. I was just wondering if there's like plans or groundwork for like a super dungeon or like a new Uber Tristram type thing, maybe? Well, w I'm sure if um, you guys get really bored and don't want to play the game anymore, we'll, we'll try to do something. But um, right now we're more focused on getting D3 done. So we haven't really thought what we do beyond that. Um, but I can promise you, if you guys destroy Inferno and you're just sitting around on your giant mounds of um, totally not ill-gotten loot, um, then we'll do something about it. Thank you. Hello. Sorry. Uh, yesterday you said that um, you revealed the cast speed for wizards are going to be related to weapon speed and arcane power regenerates at a static rate. So let's say when you run out of arcane power, you only can cast one meteor every 4.8 seconds. What are you doing to incentivize uh, having faster weapons for spells like that? For spells, oh, well, the faster weapons really uh, affect um, the academic, I think they call them academic now, the ac basically academic skills. So we have, um, for every class, one of the things that we've learned about the combat model is you have to have something to do at all times. Um, we can't really have a scenario where you completely run out of resource and you just stand around waiting for it to come back. Um, you know, you need some kind of response. In Diablo 2, you had mana potions. We didn't want to do mana potions, so we needed to make sure every class had their own kind of unique response. For the wizard, it's, um, you almost always want an academic spell because they're free. So you can cast those as much as you want, and it, you know, the attack speed is very much affected by, um, by your weapon. But some skills like Meteor, where you don't cast them very often, they do benefit from a higher damage weapon, and that's okay, because that's the kind of build that you would want with that particular skill. Whereas another skill that uses uh, a lot of arcane power, like Disintegrate, 
has a much more kind of straight, you know, constant beam that got. It's not like one blast every few seconds. It's it's um, constant. So it, it's affected a lot by weapon speed. So it really just depends upon your build. So if you want, if you want, if you've got a lot of abilities that have more of a constant or faster attack rate, then you want faster weapons. If you've got kind of big bomb abilities, you want bigger weapons. Makes sense. Thank All you. Right. Yes, I had a question about the authentication system, being that Diablo 3 is doing the actual bank accounts, per se. If the authenticator is going to be linked to Diablo 3 like they have been for StarCraft 2 and WoW. Yes. Good answer. Great answer, yeah. <laughs> a little wordy. I was clear. A little wordy. Yeah. Oh, okay. He wants to give it a little bit more wording. So, I mean, we're, I'll give the line. No, no I, was, I was joking. Oh, one word. Oh, okay. A little wordy. Oh. I was making fun of you. He's a VP. He'll have me fired later. Hey, guys. Uh, so in the panel yesterday, it was mentioned that people played with the skill menu open so they could swap between active skills and then it may be locked during combat in some way. Has any thought been giving to opening more skill slots or letting players set loadouts in town and then switch between that on the fly so the skill menu isn't used or needed? So, um, more skill slots, no, absolutely not. One of the things that, uh, reasons why we have limited the skill slots is it creates more build diversity. It forces people to make hard decisions. Um, that, you know, a lot of the things, you know, we made a lot of changes to the skill system and fairly radical changes from Diablo 2. And so one, of, one of the examples is the removal of skill points, which used to be a hard decision that the player made. So we didn't want the player to not have hard decisions. So you know, we changed those hard decisions from being skill point committal, which did force a tiny small number of skills already, to just capping the number of skills that you have. On the loadout idea, we get that suggestion a lot. It's not something we do for core release, um, but we can see maybe there might be use for it. Um, we're, we're happy to kind of let the game go out without that feature and see how much need there really is for it. And if there is, we'll consider it for the future. Thank you. Hey guys, all right. Uh, during the character design process, were there any characters you might have taken out of the game or rolled into any currently existing characters in D3? Yeah, so there's a lot of um, iteration that we do when we do the character designs and even the class design. So there's definitely um, a lot of versions or a lot of sort of small ideas we had that we really loved. And we're sort of saving those for later. Um, uh, it's a very collaborative process, so the entire team gets involved, you know, uh, and we really sort of shoot ideas back and forth. So there's definitely a lot of stuff that we sort of get out of that. Um, uh, and some of it is, is too awesome not to use at some point, so we definitely have that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. With the uh, implementation of using PayPal to buy items, I am curious what effects you think that might have, if any, on the PvP side. Say I'm going to a team deathmatch and I'm matched up against somebody that spent like $100 on his character. Um, is there any system in place to affect that or uh, help that kind of imbalance? Well, the funny thing about it is one of the things we've, uh, we're avoiding with the PvP system is creating uh, like a ranked ladder that lets you show, like, I'm the best, you know, I'm in the top five PvPers in all of, you know, Diablo land. Without that, um, all you're doing when you buy better equipment is just changing your hidden ranking, um, which is changing the quality of the players that you're fighting against or the quality of the items that they're fighting against. So it really doesn't give you a ton of benefit that you're going to see. Um, our system is going to be much more of a progression-based um, development system where the more you play PvP, the more progression you get. Um, so it doesn't really matter if you're playing it at level 30 with crappy gear or you're playing it at level 60 with ridiculous awesome gear. Um, your win rate will speed things up primarily, um, but um, having better gear just makes you feel more awesome, but it doesn't actually truly affect um, the outcomes of the games because of the, the hidden ranking. Thank you. Good afternoon, guys. Um, my question is about a pretty hot topic on the forums. Um, 
the in D2 you had the hostile system for PvP and during the open world and you're going more towards a arena style PvP right now is there can you elaborate on your thought process behind that or are we going to see some other kinds of PvP systems later on besides just the matchmaking arena so um, our thought process was there was, I, there was this fantasy in Diablo 2 of I'm out in the world, I'm excited, I'm fighting, and then all of a sudden another player shows up and it's this tense moment of who knows whether they're going to attack me or not or you know, whether my teammate's going to suddenly turn against me or not. And the truth is that those things happen in isolated incidents when Diablo 2 first came out. And then pretty much the vast majority of, of uh, PvP encounters either were... Um, I got ganked by somebody who town portaled back to town while, and went hostile while a frozen orb was still in the air. Not awesome. Um, or um, I just put a password on my game because I never want to be ganked. Um, so the fantasy of that hostile encounter, it never happened. And it, all it did was really make people not want to play together. And so we took a stance on Diablo 3 that we will never do harm to the co-op game. We'll never do anything that will make people not want to play together. And also, we kind of looked at it, too, as that really wasn't a great PvP system. It was kind of turning on a bit, but not really truly supporting PvP. So we wanted to focus a lot more on a dedicated mode that would allow those players who really want to play PvP to do it with some actual support, with, you know, um, a progression system and, and arenas built for it and, you know, UI and all the, all the great things that you, you'll get from PvP modes. So, and in the future, we will consider doing more PvP modes as well. And um, like I mentioned earlier today, I would love to have, right now we don't have like a way to duel. Um, and so that's something I think we'd really like to add. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrew from Australia. Um, on behalf of all the Australian players, I just wanted to know if you guys were planning to introduce either an offline or a land play option, or alternatively actually bring some play option or alternatively actually bring some oce like proper oceanic servers up so the rest of the world doesn't hate playing with us because of our latency? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good question. It's, it's difficult for us because basically um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to consolidate the, the number of, of different like, data centers and servers around the world so that there's actually more people that are able to play against one another. Um, but we are trying to address some of the inherent challenges with the oceanic realms. Um, we introduced the, uh, the, the ability to play in like Southeast Asia or in North America so that you have that, uh, that capability with StarCraft II. Um, I mean, Jason, if you want to talk a little bit about any tech you guys are investing to try and you know, reduce the dependency on latency, I know that like, D3 is a little less uh, like, latency sensitive than Star 2 was. Um, yeah, we've done a lot of work to try to make latency better in the game for those people who have higher latency connections, but uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have any more than that. Yeah, I mean, the other thing we've done is like in the ISPs down there, we've actually um, like been working with them to try to uh, find better routes back to where our data centers are at, because we know that like our Australian New Zealand uh, player base is huge, uh, and you know, one of these days we may decide to put a data center down there. Right now we're not planning to, though. Thank you. There. In uh, D2, there were roughly you know, six set quests you can do per act. In D3, are you going to have kind of that same feel? or Because in D2, you can just kind of skip a lot of the side quests and go to the end. Um, is there going to be any more incentive to maybe do some side quests in D3? Um, so we, I can answer the, the first part there, that we don't have a set number of quests per act. It's more of a natural flow for each act and story according to, you know, what makes sense for the story. It's not as, uh, you know, it doesn't have as much of a pattern as, as uh, D2 did. Um, to encourage people to do subquests, uh, a lot of the rewards, you know, the good item drops or the rares, etc., are out there in the world on the, on the random um, events or random dungeons. Uh, likewise, the way that we've designed many of the quest objectives, you know, some of them are fairly linear and have a strong story moment, but a lot of them have a strong exploration component 
And as you're out there, you know, looking for, let's say, a staff to, you know, make something up randomly, um, you're going to find a bunch of other events and quests on there. And uh, we try to develop it in such a way that there's no reason for you to not go ahead and do those. And in fact, it's going to be good for you on your way to finding that staff. Thank you. Uh, hi, I wanted to ask if uh, there will be any guild or clan implementation because while it's good that you don't need a big bunch of people to play in Diablo 3, uh, but still it would be good to interact with friends or at least a permanent chat room where we can hang out, uh, maybe link loots to each other, and uh, I think this social aspect is very important for the game. Yeah, um, you, can go, you can applaud for guilds. Guilds are awesome. <laughs> um, so uh, the answer, uh, guilds are awesome, but no, we're not supporting them. Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, not at least for initial release, um, but we do see the value in them. I mean, we realize that Diablo's not a game where um, you you're going to need a guild to do raids and things like that, but people still like to collect together and they still like to be social. Um, and um, it's one of those things where when we do it, I'd really like us to do it right. I'd like us to do more than just, say, a glorified chat channel. Um, and there's been, you know, some ideas in the past that were being floated for Diablo 2 that were really awesome ideas that we have um, definitely have on our wish list of things to add to Diablo 3 someday. So not right now, but maybe someday. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so in Diablo 2, uh, pull up my question. Uh, all I played was hardcore, and the most horrible feeling was uh, seeing your connection has been interrupted, and then logging back in and your character's dead. Uh, is there going to be thing to combat this technicality, or is that just another risk we take? That's a risk you play, take playing hardcore. Jason, why are you killing everyone's hardcore characters? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is part of the risk. I mean, the funny thing about hardcore is that it's one of those things where, you know, when you play D2, you really wanted to play your hardcore character online so that you can show that it was real. So it's not even a thing where, you know, people back then played it offline. It's just, it's one of those risks of, you know, our goal is to make sure that the um, our connection is as fluid as possible. That it's it, it, that it, you know, it, that our server. If, if anything goes down, we'll do everything we can to make sure it's not our fault. Uh, at least we can't guarantee the rest of the internet, but we can try and guarantee ourselves. Well, I know one of those experiences that was really bad for everybody was when you uh, you portal into say Duriel's lair in a hardcore with a hardcore character, and before you'd even loaded, you'd be dead. Um, that is, we don't want that. Um, we don't want that scenario to come up for you. So uh, we are actually designing around that. So. Thank you. Hey, my question is about the real money auction house. Uh, you said in Diablo 2 that. Uh, you said there was shady dealer or third party red sites, but you didn't really say if you were for or against them. I'm thinking about if you have the real money auction house and you have like a therm, like someone making a company just specializing in farming items and selling them on the real money auction house and thus like earning their actual keep if you're for it or against that, what's your stance on it? Well, I think by calling them shady, we did take a stance on that. <laughs> you know, and how we feel about it. Um, for us, it's all about the player experience um, and how good an experience the player is going to have. Going up to a website, um, one, okay, you had to leave the game already. That's a bad experience. Um, you might not get the item you want. That's a bad experience. You might get ripped off. That's a bad experience. Um, it's cumbersome to do. That's a bad experience. It's not accessible to everyone, so some people have more riches than others. That's a bad experience. All of these things are things we wanted to fix. So we look at it and say, you know, we want to give people a good experience. Um, we don't have an expectation that people are going to be able to make a living off of this, um, but they might be able to make a little bit of extra money, and okay, cool. That's, we have no real problem with that as long as they're having a good and fun game experience. 
Thank you. Uh, so my question was about the uh, scaling of AI mechanics on bosses throughout the difficulties. So the skeleton king does some sweeping strikes, but it's in direction one direction. He summons some skeletons. Maybe in hell he like summons skeletons that summon more skeletons, and you have to kill the hive. Or he uh, does even more mechanics that make the whole fight extremely difficult. And uh, also, can I have a hug, Jay Wilson? Can you have a hug? Yeah. Uh, meet me after the okay. panel. Not right now. Uh, oh, like right out? Yeah, no, no, I'm not doing that. Well, I, can wait I tried, three. man. I waited three years. Um, so, um, to your to your first question, um, we have a couple things that we've done, but it's not as much as we'd like to. We actually um, we're in the process of tuning the higher difficulties right now, um, and um, that's one of the things that is on our list of let's look at the other at the higher level bosses and see if there's tweaks and things that we can make to their AIs and their scripts to make them uh, a little different um, throughout. Probably only focus on the real major bosses to do that, but, um, but yeah, we have, we have kicked it around. I'm not going to promise we're going to do it, but we would like to. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, guys, how you doing? I was just wondering, I've heard a lot of talk about the lesser evils playing a large role in Diablo 3. Uh, will Malfisto, Diablo, and Bale come back to play a large role as well? Um, so there's, we, we don't want to, let's see. The, the primary villains of the game we've essentially announced and we, we want to stay vague about exactly, you know, when you fight them and exactly what they're after. We talked earlier at the lore panel, I'm not sure if you caught that, just like an hour and a half ago. Uh, Leonard explained that there is an object called the Black Soul Stone. This is the key to defeating evil forever. And uh, Asbadan knows about it before you do, and so does Belial, and they're ahead of you, so you're already paying catch-up at this point. The first mystery of the game, which is in the um, beta, is what is this thing that fell from the sky? And the beta ends very shortly before you answer that question, which is why that's how much content you have to play in there, because we don't want to spoil that. So um, suffice to say that there is a major shift um, in the structure of the world um, that happens during Diablo 3. Like some big things are coming, but not in a way that I can be specific as you want me to be to explain it, because it's going to be uh, major stories. But certainly, we answer a lot of questions about the primevals. We answer a lot of questions about the angels. And I, I think I can say that this game is sort of about the ascent of man. This is the, the moment where, more than any time in history, um, human beings come into their own and, and sort of find their place in the eternal conflicts. Um, and you, the hero, are going to decide what that means for humanity. So this, it's, it's a pretty cool story. I just, um, I wish I could tell you guys more, but I really don't want you. I want you to experience it, you know, in the flow of the game that we have. Thank you. Hello. Where am I? There I am. Uh, first of all, the pig plays classic rock, okay? Oh, of course. And uh, suggestion for the hardcore PvP. Um, basically, you could have a choice to play for your character, like if he loses, he won't die. Or you could have them play for each other's gear. And my question is, what are you doing for the individuality of the uh, characters? Like, there was a lot of platins with uh, Shaco and Enigma and D2, and is that going to happen again? Yeah, absolutely. We're doing a ton of stuff um, for uh, individuality. One of the big ones um, that we're really excited about is we've put in a whole die system. Uh, I think we have 16 different colors, and pretty much er almost everything you can wear can be dyed. Um, every class has at least has uh, three class-specific items they can wear. Um, two of which actually affect the visual look, and then there's hundreds of, um, on top of just the normal kind of weapon and item art, there's hundreds of unique items that um, are, are each have kind of their own unique art, and many of which are designed to be very memorable, kind of legendary and, and unique items, like, like your Wind Forces and your Ring of the Zodiac and, and uh, Enigmas and things like that, although nothing as game-breaking as Enigma. 
And not to mention the, the banner system, which also is a great way for you to show off all of your progress through the game and your achievements to your friends, and you can customize that with uh, different dyes and different uh, banner emblems as well. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, I actually have a question and a follow-up question. Uh, the first question is the PvP system in Diablo 3. I started Diablo 2 back in around 2000. The last three years, or the last six, seven years of my Diablo 2 career were leading a major PvP clan on East. And the arena is just, it's kind of similar to the 09 PvP without the enigmas and the 16, 17, 18 different viable PvP builds for characters. Are you planning on releasing anything like Enigma or the Synergy system that actually allowed the many different PvP balances that Diablo 2 had? Well, um, I guess the... I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but I guess my answer would be if you're looking at the PvP here and thinking, oh, um, going into PvP, I, I go in with these pre-made locked builds, that's not how it works. Like, we have to put builds into the game here so that people don't spend, you know, 30 minutes. They're 30 minutes basically just building a character. So we just kind of give you a pre-built build. But every, um, when you take a character into PvP in Diablo 3, it's your single player character. So it has all the build options. And, uh, you know, we have uh, calculated it somewhere in the area of 2.8 trillion different builds. So there's definitely a massive number of potential ways you can build characters. And then you take on top of that, since it's team-based game, the combination of different characters and then the combinations of their abilities with one another um, create an enormous number of variations. So um, I, I think that is an answer to your question. Uh, the second question was, how, the PvP arena is, is, I know where you do the PvP, but are you going to allow any kind of dueling outside of the arena where there's big open fields? Well, like I said earlier, we, we don't have a way to do that now, um, and we're not going to allow people to go hostile within the core game, but I would like people to be able to do kind of free-form dueling, um, and whether we can get that in for ship or not, um, we're not sure at this time, but it's definitely something we want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I spent a lot of money on my computer. I'm just curious for the lighting effects. I know other games are uh, having that in there with Diablo 3. I'm sorry, I, I, I missed the line. Um, so, can you repeat such the question? As, such as alien effects for lighting for computers, is there going to be a type of support for that? But, do, do you... Uh, yeah. Kind of like Are you having the case itself light up, like an actual mod for Kind of like Dungeon Siege, where the lighting would change according to your yeah. life, mana, etc. Oh, um, we, I wouldn't rule it out, but we have not done any work on something like that. Thank you. Uh, as we move through normal through Inferno, will the randomized dungeons be getting larger in size? Um, we don't currently have plans to do something like that, so I don't think that'll be shipping with the, with the base version of the game. Um, that's an interesting idea, and we have talked about it, so possibly in the future, but not for the initial game. Thank you. Uh, Hi, I just wanted to say that I came out from Guam, and this is my first BizCon, and it's awesome. So thank you for all of this. Awesome. Thanks for coming, brother. And, um, thank my you. Question, my question is, um, what are your guys' uh, thoughts on class skills that combo off of each other, like aiming a disintegrate at a monk while he's using impenetrable defense to make it bounce off in a different direction? So um, we've talked about ideas like that in the past, and what we find is that you, you, people latch on to one or two that they really love. Like, oh, the wizard freezes somebody, and then everybody, every, you know, the demon hunter smashes it with uh, a particular skill, or the barbarian does, and that does more damage, or the rebound one has come up a couple times. 
And then when you, but then when you sit down and go, okay, let's do this across all the classes and all the skills, such that in a way that it won't force people to have to take certain builds. Um, you know, we don't ever want a case where a barbarian enters and goes, oh, you're a wizard and you don't have Frost Nova. Um, okay, I don't want to play with you because I won't be able to do more damage. So when we try to come up with just ways to do that across the whole game, we find that there's just there's not a lot of meat there for systems like that. Um, and that at the end, we think it would actually have more negative connotations than positive ones. It's a great, it's a great kind of fantasy, um, but we've never figured out a way to do it in a way that we didn't think would hurt, actually hurt the game. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, is there gonna be a web front end or API for the auction hall or your character at launch? Um, we, we talked about it, but not, uh, we don't have plans to do it at launch, but we have talked about uh, adding functionality on the website. Thank you. We're coming down to five minutes, so just enough time to get a few more of you in. All right, well, my question is, if you beat Diablo 2 on normal or hardcore, will you get a bonus item? And my second question is, do you guys have any idea if you guys are going to implement a PC controller into Diablo 3? Um, so no, we don't have any plans to do any kind of bonus items for having completed the previous games, although it's not a bad idea. Um, and um, the other one was like using a, like a console-style controller with the PC game? No, just a normal PC controller that you can buy at Walmart, not like the Xbox or the PS3 controller. Yeah, like a gamepad, you mean. Um, um, not at release. Um, we might, as the console version continues, I'm sure we'll at least consider it and look into it, but there's a lot of controls problems to fix. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, doing multiple control schemes is a pretty big challenge. So I think we'd only do it if we could pull learning over from uh, our console development. Um, but initially, no, we don't plan to support that. Thank you. Hey, uh, my question is actually a fairly simple one, but one that kind of worries me because I haven't heard any official word on it, and it could be particularly detrimental to the new experimental builds, or the more experimental builds that you guys want to take with classes. Uh, so, are you actually able to switch around runes after you apply them to a certain ability? And if you can, what happens to the runes afterwards? Does said rune just go back in your inventory, or is it destroyed and you'll have to trek around for a new one? Um, you, you, every system we've done, you can remove runes um, kind of freely. Uh, we may move, we may put the same kind of restrictions on switching that we're currently experimenting with on the skill system. Um, to, again, give more build commitment. It's really important to us that when people go out into the world, we, they feel like they're committed to a very specific build um, because that's where a lot of the interest in creating your character comes from. Um, but once you go back to town, we don't really see any need to um, put this big cost and, like, you pull a rune out and you destroy it or we don't let you switch things out. Like, experimentation is part of the fun of Diablo, so we try to, we've taken a, a philosophy of let people do it as much as we can possibly allow. Thank you. Hi, I was wondering if for the players who are buying the 12 months of WoW and they get the D3 for free, um, is there going to be an option for them to get the collector's edition as well, or have you discussed this? Awesome. That's a great question. Um, uh, we totally talked about it. We know that there's a lot of people that... Uh, they're basically going to want the collector's edition specifically, so absolutely. In fact, what's going to happen is if you buy the collector's edition, it's going to count as a credit towards that 12 months purchase. Wow, great question. We okay for one more? Well done, Rob. Thank you. That's a good one to end it on. I think uh, I'm being told we can do one more. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. I, um, in WoW, there's always like a top tier of gear. In Diablo, how much, how many options are people going to have once they reach like the very end game content as far as gear goes? Well, um, it's it, it's hard to give a specific number because our gear is randomly generated. So um, in Inferno, there's three kind of tiers of gear, and there definitely is like a best in class tier 
Um, but even a tier down, if it, you get the right roles, can be as good or better than the tier up. So it kind of depends upon how the item rolls um, and what kind of, you know, and what specifically you're looking for. Um, and while a lot of the times, you know, if you're a particular class, there's very rarely, there's usually not a lot of variation in the kind of stats that you're looking for. Uh, it only really varies by the kind of activities you're doing. Whereas in Diablo, depending on how you build your character and what skills you choose um, and what your playstyle is, um, there's a really much broader array of items that you can possibly be interested in. So you could pick up an item that for somebody else is one of the best items in the game, but for you is, even though it's something you could wear and has good stats, you're not interested because maybe you're not interested in a crit gear or, or whatever particular affixes are there. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Everybody give them a round of applause. Thank you for attending the Diablo 3 Open Q&A panel. Up next, World of Warcraft, Class, Items, and Professions Q&A panel, beginning at 1 o'clock.